This is a cabal of likely suspects, so-called because our friends seem to think, well, we're the people who are most likely to cause an apocalypse, but we're here to come up with some helpful tips for the Apocalypse Rising track for Survival series. And we have Jeremy Stitch Levitt. Give us a wave, Jeremy. hey -o. Who is a machinist and a mechanical engineer. We have Sandra Medlock, who is a journalist, an editor, a tech writer, a teacher, and an author. We have Bridget Correa, who is a prepper mom, who's going to talk with us about various preparations since she lives way, way out the way from civilization, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and uh, we have Evil Penguin. And Evil Penguin is a scientist who can talk to us about all sorts of medical and brain stuff and is totally not responsible for causing zombies, right? I uh, can neither confirm nor deny anything at this time. And we have Philip Dockfather Woolrab, who is the, the combat medic most likely to cause an apocalypse when the infantrymen do not follow the safety briefing on Friday afternoon. Well, you know, when you get that uh, drug-resistant uh, STI, uh, maybe it takes you into a weird place. And we have Smitty the Beer Guy, who, who uh, this is Chris Smith, and Chris has a great uh, experience with what goes wrong when things start growing in the pipes and the tubing and the plumbing and the everything else, as well as uh, some ideas when you decide you're going to go scavenging. What are some things you might decide, oh, that looks nice, uh-uh, stay away, stay away, stay away. And we are the Cabal. I am Rob Hampson, the speaker to Lab Animals, and we're glad to have you with us tonight. So the first question up and our first segment is going to be on first aid. What is in your first aid kit? And one of the things we keep hearing a lot, uh, particularly from the, the uh, military members and first uh, responders are always talking about tourniquets, tourniquets, tourniquets. Now that's a great idea if you're going to have access to higher level medical care. So if your survival preparation is how to survive the next hurricane, the next earthquake, the next tornado, that's a great idea. But if it's truly the fall of civilization, are you really gonna have access to higher level care? Hey doc. Yeah, so if we're talking about a first aid kit for, you know, 24, 36, 48 hours, you just, you really want the basics, uh, stuff that'll stop the bleed. So for like major arterial bleeds, yeah, you want that tourniquet uh, or from bleeding from extremities. Uh, pressure bandages uh, of some type. Um, and then uh, gauze, stuff that you can pack a wound with. Uh, these days you can get the, um, uh, combat gauze that we carried in Iraq and Afghanistan on the civilian market, uh, usually in the sporting goods section uh, or in the camping section. Uh, and you're looking for something that's like Sealox uh, or, or one of the others. Um, <clears throat> and what that is, is uh, for, for, you know, severe bleeding, uh, it has an agent in it to help stop the bleed. Uh, when it's not on an extremity. Um, other things, you know, your basic band-aids, basic first aid stuff, uh, you know, a pair of tweezers, uh, a good pair of scissors uh, that uh, can cut either cut through uh, bandages or perhaps cut through some clothing. Um, you know, these are all good things to have in the first aid kit, uh, an emergency blanket, uh, you know, either to treat for shock or to, to keep yourself warm. Um, and then the really, <clears throat> the really important part about it is be, tr uh, find places where you can get training on all this stuff. Uh, take a, uh, a first responder course, uh, you know, 
usually you can find them put on by your local fire or rescue <clears throat> excuse me uh, your local fire or rescue uh, services uh, often have classes take a CPR course uh, and stay current on the, the CPR um, Anything that you have in your first aid kit, have some basic level of training on how to use that material. Don't use something that you're not trained to use because uh, you may end up causing more injury than you, you know, not that you intend to, but you may end up causing more harm than uh, good. A few years back, a number of, you know, the internet friends were talking about buying surgical tools and surgical supplies and all of that stuff. And the point, you know, we talked about it and I talked about it with them. I said, Hey guys, do you actually know how to use any of that stuff? And they go, no, but I figured I'd have it just in case. And I go, yeah, maybe if you can find someone that does know how to use it, but if you don't know how to use it, don't even try. Right. Cause again, you could create, uh, or you can cause further harm than, uh, than, you know, just doing the basic level stuff. And uh, I will be honest, every veterinary vet I know has their own set of tools already. Most people who know how to use them have their own set. I want to put in a pitch for a little device. This is called a Bovi. And it is a, um, it's an electrocautery just uses a couple of uh, AA batteries. And what it does is it heats up a filament and you can use that for cauterizing small wounds. You wouldn't want to do it for anything very large. You wouldn't want to be using it as if it were a scalpel, but what it is is it, it can be very useful just for stopping small bleeds, something that might be bleeding a little bit more than what a, uh, than what your uh, 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 clotting factor gauze would do and less than what you might need in a surgical setting. It's something that you can add. It is something that you can get training on. You can go to the companies and find out about them uh, and learn how to use them. But uh, that's something that could be added to a kit. Uh, we had a... When we're talking about things like, you know, buying tourniquets, not all tourniquets are created equal. Uh, make sure you're getting them from a reputable source. Uh, so, you know, be careful about what you order on Amazon. It may look really good uh, in the picture and it may look like it's, uh, you know, the, the, um, a, a proper tourniquet, but then you get it and it's glued together as opposed to stitched together. It's, you know, it's some kind of cheap knockoff. Um, this is one of those areas where you don't want to buy cheap, you know, maybe buy from a reputable dealer, uh, make sure what you're getting, uh, is the actual product that, you know, that you bought, uh, and then, uh, have some for your first aid kit, but have some that you can practice with. Do not use the stuff that you practiced with in your first aid kit because as you practice with uh, particularly like the, um, the, the combat application tourniquet, which is what I'm most familiar with, um, when you practice with those, they, they stretch over time. And so they're less effective. Um, the, the cat tourniquet. Okay, Continue. sorry. Yeah, so the, the cat tourniquet, uh, that's the one that you see most commonly uh, in the military. Uh, you, you're seeing them in some uh, rescue, police, fire departments. Um, it's kind of the, the, the gold standard when it comes to ease of use uh, and then durability. They're on like their seventh generation, seventh or eighth generation now of mm. the tourniquet. So they're very much improved. Uh, from the from the first generation ones, uh, so just the, that's one that I personally recommend. But that's because I have a lot of practice with those. Um, you'll see out on the market different types. Uh, really do your homework on uh, any of the equipment that you buy. 
uh, and make sure you know they're reputable. Make sure they they've got good reviews from inside the medical community, uh, because again, with the popularity of uh, prepping, with the popularity of um, some of the the medical products that have come out of the military, uh, not all of those companies are are reputable or put out good product. Um, so don't rely just on like a company's website. Actually go find uh, members of the community and talk to them about it. Uh, what, what do they have in their kit? What are they using? What are they practicing? One of the things I would like to uh, bring up, I at a time when I was buying some medical instruments like forceps, like clamps, uh, forceps, you, you know, what you might think of as tweezers, but very fine for doctor use. Uh, I ordered some up from a company and they were imports. And within a month of arrival, they were corroded. So you do mm -hmm. have to watch out for that sort of thing. There's a, there's a common wisdom, which is not so wise, that says don't worry about expiration dates because expiration dates oh. are put on things to, uh, so that the company can sell more. I, I was going to bring this up. Go ahead. Actually. But yes, no, expiration dates are important. The expiration date on, for what we've been talking about, the combat gauze, the quick clot gauze, it's there for a reason because the, it's, the chemicals in it do break down after a while. Don't right. listen to the internet where they say, oh, it's good for 10, 20 years afterwards. Yes, they're good for about 10 years the expiration dates are usually about 10 years out, but you do have to rotate the stuff, especially anything that has any sort of antiseptic or some sort of, um, you know, any, any sort of chemical, especially chemical stuff. You so need it to is, keep an eye on expiration dates. Yeah, so it is worthwhile to bring up that there are two types of expiration dates on medical equipment. Some of it is an actual expiration date. Some of it is something called a sterility date. And that is that if the package stays intact, they guarantee the sterility of what's inside the package up to this point in the date. And then after that, they can no longer guarantee that it's sterile. Um, you see that on, a, on like just basic gauze, uh, stuff of that nature. Things that aren't, um, that don't have a chemical or a, um, uh, uh, some kind of treatment in it, uh, but there is a date on the package, and that's what that's usually referring back to. For the antibiotics, uh, pain relievers and stuff, uh, Evil Penguin, will you tell us a little bit about what happens when that does break down? Uh, it really depends on what the chemical is, and one of the things with uh, touching on this, with the expiration date, you have the sterility date, but with the expiration date, some of it also relies on how it's being stored. Um, a lot of things are reactive with oxygen or other chemicals in the atmosphere. So a sealed bottle is going to have a different expiration date than an open bottle. Um, so once you, so even when you look at food, a lot of it you'll see refrigerate after opening and then good for a certain period of time. And that's because you start having reactions once that seal is broken. Uh, one of the other things you need to consider with expiration dates is where you're storing it and how you're storing it. Something that you throw in your trunk that's going to go through a lot of cyclic heating in the daytime where it gets really hot, then it cools down and really hot and cools down, that's going to have less of an expiration date than something you keep in a nice cool closet inside of your house. So expiration dates vary on how they're being stored. When it comes to medical equipment, uh, medicines, you also have to look at, are they being bounced around? Are be the packaging being knocked? Is it being disturbed? Because you could have a package, say of a medical instrument that's nice and sterile, but if it's constantly rattling around, you can have damage to the packing that's going to void all of that if you have it opened up and then it's no longer sterile. So well, the other just, issue with that is if you have, if you're talking about, you know, um, pills and whatnot, you know, medications, 
if they're in a bottle and they're rattling around and they're say an extended release sort of thing, you, you may have your extended release aspirin, but if it's been rattling around in a bottle for two years, I'm sure that coating has started to wear off from bouncing. It can start bouncing around. Um, the gel caps can start melting and you can get, instead of a nice gel cap with loose powder, you can get kind of this clump that has something melted around it that I've seen before. Um, so just because it has a standard expiration date, depending on what you're doing to it, you can either shorten, you can shorten that time by quite a bit. So that's one of the things you need to check things regularly and don't just go off of the stated date. There's a couple of things you can do. You can give things a sniff test. If it smells like rotten meat, then the gel capsule is probably broken down. If it smells of vinegar, then it's possible that some of the chemical components have broken down. It may also smell of formaldehyde, in which case is another indication that some of the chemicals inside it have broken down. So this is our segment on the first aid kit. Beware of what you're packing. And we will be back with more apocalypse tips for survival snippets in a few minutes. <laughs> 